Sitting here at uh, Vikram Sarabhai yeah. Space Center, how long have you been involved with the Indian well, Space Program? Uh, okay, this is my career in the sense I joined here immediately after my studies. Uh -huh. I did uh, uh, BE Mechanical Engineering and M.Tech in Aerospace Propulsion. So, 1972, August, I joined this place. Right. So, I was just so, after the demise of... Uh, oh, yeah, Sarabhai. yeah, right. I think when I was doing M.Tech, 71, December, mm -hmm. Sarabhai passed away, I remember. Did you ever meet him? No, I never met him. In fact, I only heard of him after I joined. Because when I joined here, he was no more. Yes, and... and 40, uh, 41 years. In fact, August 16th, I joined. And just a couple of days back, I have completed... A specialist in liquid propulsion. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have spent a lot of time on liquid propulsion. But I'm basically a propulsion engineer in aeronautics, uh -huh. aeronautical engineer. Right. But then I have been more, or, more of a launch... Look out your window here. Mm -hmm. um, it must have changed over that time. What is, um, what are sort of facilities and what activities are conducted by ISRO here on this site? Well, if you ask me, um, this place itself, if you see, okay, in fact, I saw your question. When I look at, out of the window, I will say the view is the same of the beautiful sea, you know, right. so, you know, there's a hillock, and then yeah. I recall when I joined first, my office was in the building just outside the gate, you would have seen there. But from there, the, the, you have a beautiful view of the sea and fantastic, and that remains the same. And uh, the center has grown into really a multidisciplinary technological center. We have today um, several entities, several, uh, maybe a dozen entities, I can say, uh, and each one uh, specializing an area. For example, we have aeronautics entity, we have avionics entity, we have propellant and chemical entity. Mm -hmm. We have uh, propulsion system, mechanisms, and vehicle integration entity. Like that, it has grown. The total um, activity of launch vehicles, I will say even this center contributes to spacecraft systems also. Mm -hmm. For example, we have a composite entity right. where a lot of uh, uh, spacecraft structural elements are fabricated. The payload uh, support structure, the optics cylinder, lightweight things uh -huh. like that we have gone into every discipline involved in space how many people are based here now approximately approximately we have about 4000 people here wow that is, right. that is big and you still launch sounding rockets from here yeah we do yeah we do uh, we in fact um, until a few years back we were doing it regularly every wednesday evening uh -huh. night 7:30 and uh, now we are doing, uh, if I'm not wrong, probably twice or once or twice a month for two things. One is that um, to keep those, you know, the whole activity started with sounding rocket launch. You would have heard of that. Yeah. 1963, you know, the Nike Apache rocket went uh, off from the Tumba rocket launching uh, pad. And it was an American rocket. And that is when the whole activity started and the it was um, dedicated as a UN center for any country to come and make mm. their sounding rocket launch. PSLV mm. launch itself was mm. designed for um, sun synchronous uh, polar, orbit, polar orbits. Yeah, yeah. Now, that doesn't matter mm. if it's the east coast or the west coast, does it, if it's polar orbit? No, uh, it matters. Because for polar orbit, you are right. For polar orbit, uh, launching from east coast mm. is not, because you want to launch due south, south in anyway. fact. Yeah, so, so obviously, the, the advantage for uh, the east coast is only for the yeah. synchronous orbit, where you want uh, yeah. equatorial orbit. You mm -hmm. gain about almost half a kilometer per second by launching due, due south. If I can launch, yeah. obviously, be that's the but best. But you've got thing. Sri Lanka in the way. Ah, in so the way. So that. naturally, you have to skirt it. Skirt you were around. involved in the development of the PSLV. I was. Yeah, I was involved. I joined uh, the SLV three team, mm -hmm. and then after SLV three was. Uh, successfully completed in 80. I was there for two continuation launches, SLV-3 D1. Uh, we had D1, D2, E01, E02, then D1, D, D2, D3. Eh? Yeah, mm -hmm. three launches. And uh, D4, sorry, four launches. I think after that, I moved to PSLV. Right. And PSLV, I moved in 1983. Uh -huh. Then I was in PSLV till 2002. Right. Uh, I was there from the beginning, the development launch. Mm -hmm. In 93, we had the first launch, which was uh, not successful because of a software glitch. Then 94, we had the first successful launch, PSLV D2. 
then I was there in D3 as vehicle director and then in PSLV after D3 launch, uh, the PSLV continuation program was uh, uh, approved and I was the project director for that and I was uh, handling the projects for four continuation launches, C1, C2, C3, C4. So after those four launches, uh, it was C4 was in 2002 and then I moved over to GSLV Mark III, the future generation vehicle as project director in October 2002. And it was during that period that uh, you increased the payload, yeah. almost doubled it from 900 to, kg uh, to 1500. Yeah. You know, when we, achieve yeah, that? Yeah. when we did the PSLV uh, design, the objective was that it has to cater to a Indian remote sensing satellite launching from India. The remote sensing satellites were of about one ton class when we made the first IRS 1C and all, which was being launched by, at the time we, we had a launch support from USSR, then USSR. And uh, so one ton, 1000 kg was put as a the payload uh, target for PSLV. The vehicle design was made for one ton right. payload, <laughs> sun synchronous polar orbit of uh, around 800 kilometers orbit. And But when you develop a launch vehicle, what happens is uh, the systems, mass control, and then when you do a development vehicle, definitely there will be a growth of weight. So when we were ready for the first launch, D1, uh, our payload capability was around 850 to 900 kilograms. And, uh, and one also plays conservative in the initial launches. So D1 was only about 850. D2 successful wall launch was also around that figure. And D3 we slightly increased it to, to about uh, 900. But then after the D3 success, and by that time we also had the issue of the continued uh, support from you. By then the USSR had uh, broken up Russia and, uh, mm -hmm. and so we had a really difficulty in getting the launch support and the cost had also gone up and uh, then uh, then uh, chairman was Dr. Kasturirangan. So he gave a directive that IRS launches, next launch on which it should go on PSLV. Then with that, there was also a demand that the PSLV, the IRS 1D, mm -hmm. up to 1C it had been committed with Russian launch, 1D. And 1D mass was 1,200 kilograms. So there was a demand that PSLV continuation program, C1, we have to target to reach the payload of 1,200 kilograms. So it was from 900 to 1,200. That was kind of, not double actually, it's about 30 to 40 percent enhancement. And what so, engineering changes did you have? No, to make? actually, we, we, you know, in a launch vehicle, if you want to increase its performance, there are only two ways of doing it. One is reduce the inert weight. Mm -hmm. That means uh, all structural weights are inert weight; they don't add energy. Right. So or the casing thin, casing or or fewer. Other. Then, or alternate thing is all the the complementing thing is increase the energetics. That ah, means right. increase the propellant loading. We, yeah. we, in fact, we did both. If you take uh, SLV3, uh, sorry, PSLV D3 to C1, first stage uh, was S125, mm -hmm. 125 tons of solid propellant mm -hmm. in five segments. Now we saw the design and found that now we have done two static tests and we have also done four flights, so we had a handle on the motor behavior. Mm -hmm. So we saw why we can't push in more propellant, reduce the port area increase the propellant loading. So we increased the first stage propellant loading from 125 tons to something like 139 tons. And this, the dimensions will remain same. Remains, case obviously. remains same. Right. That means you make the web thicker, you try to see the port reduction, mm -hmm. the inside burning port. Right. So see how much to, to the limit, you increase the limit right. of, uh, you touch the limit of operation. Uh -huh. See when the port becomes narrower, narrower, the erosive burning characteristics can come mm -hmm. and also the the intensity, the pressure and temperature, all those factors one has to take. And the peak pressure which reaches should be with. So within the design margin, right. we enhanced the, right. so 125 increased to 139. Number two, we had, um, we have six strap-ons, uh -huh. you know, the SLV first stage is acting as strap-on. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the aerodynamics point of view, if you want to make sure the, when it crosses the thick atmosphere, the velocity is limited. That's a dynamic pressure and structural limit. Mm -hmm. So we initially, initial flights we had gone with two strap-ons igniting on ground mm -hmm. and once you go to thinner atmosphere, the remaining four strap-ons come. Right. Now 
we said what if we make four step on to ignite on ground that means the initial velocity build up will be faster mm -hmm. and of course it increases the aerodynamic loading right. but it gives you a advantage of enhanced performance you get right. more payload so f from two four sequence we made to four two sequence this right. tap on burning four in the ground lit and two in air lit right. this tap on sequence next second stage we looked at the it was 37.5 ton was the liquid propellant loaded. Uh -huh. Then we saw within the, there the engine is a uncooled engine with a composite throat. So that was deciding the burn duration. Mm -hmm. So we saw, look at the margin available. So in from about 110 seconds of burn duration, mm -hmm. we find that, found that engine can burn maybe up to 130, 140 seconds, that margin. So we loaded. 37.5 plus 2.5 tons, 40 ton we made. The second stage was made from L, it was stretched, tank was slightly stretched right. to take more propellant uh -huh. and burning for a longer duration, right. to sell 40 we did. Then third stage was a composite uh, solid motor, there we tried to already in D3 we had uh, optimized the case thickness and all, we mm -hmm. further optimized reduce in it. Mm -hmm. Then fourth stage we found that we had the 2 ton is the propellant loading mm -hmm. and uh, there we saw whether any more um, mass, inert mass reduction can be done. Mm -hmm. We introduced the composite uh, payload adopter, you know, from metallic payload adopter between the vehicle and the payload. Right. And similarly, four-stage structure also, we introduced some composite elements to reduce weight. All these measures we added up to get that 300 kg. That's a huge technical yeah, it is huge. In a, in a single challenge. step, it is huge. Yeah. And at the time, we were driven by the necessity. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we did it boldly with uh, all the tests and analysis and we had the confidence, well, touch. We, we were lucky. <laughs> and it worked in the first attempt, all, all these changes, uh, whatever we had done, the analysis and tests were adequate in first flight, all of them worked. And I hadn't appreciated, uh, one of the questions I had, and you've answered it now, was why this is the case that you don't light all the strap-ons on the ground? Mm. And it's because... It will become, uh, become higher, the your dynamic pressure will... Because the acceleration initially you keep adding, mm -hmm. in thick atmosphere the velocity is getting added. Oh, yeah. So the dynamic pressure... Uh, so you have to have a strong in physical integrity. Uh, you the integrity, vehicle. the structural integrity of the vehicle, the That's loads on the vehicle yeah. will en enormously increase. Mm -hmm. See here, if you take a launch vehicle, the trick is as you add velocity, you get out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. See, you have to reach 8 kilometers per second. You can't imagine adding the 8 kilometers per second in ground level. Now, no structure will withstand so both heat and, structure and uh, the strength, mm -hmm. the thermal and the mechanical st stress. Whereas, so you, as you add velocity, you must also get out, get into thinner and thinner. Have much experience or hands-on activity involvement within the development of the cryogenic engine as well? No, I, I can't say that because, uh, as I said, I have been very well associated with PSLV mm -hmm. almost 20 years, uh -huh. which didn't have cryogenic system. The cryogenic system was introduced for the first time in the GSLV. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mm, association in, with cryogenics was happened uh, subsequently as a reviewer for the GSLV system because I didn't directly work in GSLE project, mm -hmm. but then the GSLE bar 3, which I took over after PSLE, a new bigger vehicle project, we had a cryogenic stage. We have configured, in fact, with a 20 ton thrust cryo engine and a 25 ton loaded stage. In that context, that, uh, uh, that stage design and engine development had opportunity to be associated with. But of course, in the GSLE program, I have been associated as a reviewer. And then subsequently, I have been in liquid propulsion system center for about two years as director before All coming. the rocket propulsion systems are mass-driven systems. That means you have to expand mass to gain velocity. Mm -hmm. So when you want to have to carry heavier payload or when you want to go to farther distances and you want delta V mm -hmm. addition as V, you have to have mass to expand to get that mm -hmm. one. And the impulse or momentum you gain per unit boss expulsion mm -hmm. is the merit factor that you since you are familiar with the field it's called specific impulse mm -hmm. the impulse derived out of unit mass expulsion the so cryogenic has the advantage that you get higher than solid or conventional liquid right. the specific impulse for cryogenic is about 450 seconds 450 so, seconds whereas a uh, standard liquid propellant you touch 330 320 right. 330 
So, about 330, 350 to 450, that is the kind of delta you get. Right. When you come to solid, it is in the range of 270 to 80 right. maximum, 250 to 280. So, that is why the cryogenic is important when I want to have more powerful, high, higher performing vehicle mm -hmm. with less takeoff weight. Mm -hmm. The yeah. same performance I want to do with solid, my takeoff weight will be uh, enormously lost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A thousand ton solid vehicle <laughs> will be equivalent to a 500 ton cryogenic uh, right. propeller, like such kind of thing. That's so, uh, cryogenic engines give you essentially twice the efficiency you would You get. can say in terms of uh, impulse per unit mass mm. of propellant. So, if that's the case, why not have cryogenic fuel for each of the stages and mm. not bother with liquid and solid anyway? Mm. <laughs> you know, that's so that you have to get into slightly more detail. <laughs> we only talk about now the, the efficiency in terms of unit mass uh -huh. of propellant. Now, to carry each kg of propellant, you need a container. Mm -hmm. Now, when you come to the container which contains the propellant, so what will decide? One kg of propellant, now the density comes into picture. Right. If a very low density one kg of propellant, I need a huge container. Yeah. So, the container weight and size goes up. Right. So, the advantage of cryogenic with the LH2 and LOX, the LH2 as you know is a very light element. Mm -hmm. to, so, if you see cryogenic propellant tanks, the LH2 tank, the volume will be large. Right. So, then slowly at some point, ah, that offsets the performance advantage. Right. The, then, when the volume is large, it's not just the inert weight, the cross section of the vehicle also. Right. Big tank, then the aerodynamic uh, drag effect. So, it, there is a trade-off. PSLV has a terrific track record, yeah. um, but because of its limit, mm. it can only manage, oh, it actually, you know, it has managed uh, uh, geosynchronous orbit, no, and no. indeed with Chandrayaan, it even reached the moon. No, no, uh, see, see, we should not, uh, we have to take, uh, take this point very clearly. Uh, when we talk about a vehicle performance, Again, you can trade between the mass of the spacecraft and the distance or the mission you want to perform. Mm -hmm. For example, when you take PSLV, if you want to take uh, a, a spacecraft to a low Earth orbit, say mm -hmm. 300 by 400 kilometers, mm -hmm. you can even take about uh, 2 tons, 2 to 2.5 tons. Mm -hmm. But when you want to go to 800 kilometer sun synchronous polar orbit, it is touching 1.2 to 1.1. If you want to go to GTO, you go to 1.2, 1.5. You understand? Geotransfer yeah, orbit. So, mm -hmm. the delta V is required for these different missions or different payload. For an SSP at 800, the payload mass will be something. When you go to GTO, payload mass further shrinks. When you go to moon, uh, yes, for moon, in fact, we don't use the direct ascent to moon. We are only again putting it into a GTO. Right. And from there, the spacecraft propulsion system takes it to moon. Right. So, it is almost like GTO payload capability. Right. But the uh, PSLV is being used for the forthcoming Mars. Uh, we go in through uh, four, three, four orbits, orbits and then, and then uh, make an ascent. In fact, in the case of uh, Chandrayaan, mm -hmm. what we did was we were always having earthbound orbits with increasing apogee yeah. and made the apogee to equal to the distance to moon and rendezvoused with uh, moon when it approached. In this case, we are not going to do that because the, uh, the distance is so large. <laughs> yeah. We are putting it through uh, three, four, I do not know exactly, it is still being worked out, the optimum thing, uh, elliptical orbits with extending uh, apogee, probably I think 80,000 of that order it goes. Mm -hmm. And then we take off into a ascent trajectory. important is GSLV, particularly GSLV-3, to the future missions that... See, as I said, uh, the, the any launch vehicle that's the same, you know, launch vehicle, if you want to do as a physics or simplistic way, they are nothing but velocity machines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. They take object from Earth yeah. at its address and throw into space some velocity. Yes. Yes. In space, when you have velocity, you can reach anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's only question of... Now, when I come to JSLV Mar 3, as I said, in PSLV, I can put in LEO 2 to 2.5 ton. With Mar 3, I can put 10 ton low Earth orbit. So, you can understand the yeah. capability. Once you put 10 ton low Earth orbit, in 10 ton you can have a manned capsule, you can have a small space station. So, the uh, Mark uh, 3, I suspect in a few months, a year, will be at least successfully tested with the cryogenic engine. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, Mark 3, uh, what we are planning to mm -hmm. test immediately in the near future mm -hmm. 
is without cryogenic state. Right. We are, we want, because the remaining, it's, it's a three stage vehicle, the two solid boosters strap ons are ready, mm -hmm. the core liquid stage is ready, we have ground tested and is, uh, so, and of course the cryo stage is going to take longer time, it is a totally indigenous effort of 20 ton engine, 25 ton stage, we are just about entering the engine testing phase. Mm -hmm. To realize the stage, it is going to take a couple of more years. Mm -hmm. So we want to gain some experience and insight into the vehicle characteristics. So we are flying the what is proposed in the near term is mm -hmm. a suborbital flight of GSLE Mark III uh -huh. with only the first two stage live. Ah, I see. And the cryo stage is a simulator. Right. Uh, we have the stage, but not a no. functional no. stage. Right. It'll, uh -huh. So it won't reach the final velocity to get into orbit. Right. It will go only up to about 5 kilometers per second, mm -hmm. perhaps. And yeah. then it will... And it's coming back into the Bay of Bengal? Yeah. The yeah. straight axis yeah. up and then... It's a suborbital, suborbital flight. flight. Yes. Right. That's a evaluation. We call it as experimental mission. Mm -hmm. We felt that we can mature the other systems in, right. in the time instead of... And we'll be able to resolve a lot of issues vehicle-related and when we have the cryo stage, even the first flight, we'll have much more. Quality. You mentioned earlier that you've been with uh, working in this base industry for 41 years. Mm. What would you say has been the most uh, satisfying part of your career? What have you enjoyed the most? In fact, uh, if you ask me, I have enjoyed every day of my <laughs> career. Here. I, I still feel as excited as I was at the time. PSLV has been a very satisfying experience mm. for me because I was involved in that for almost 20 years, yeah. half of my career, yeah. and uh, definitely the making it operational and a robust launch vehicle. You know, the PSLV first launches, each launch used to be so tense, and we had problems. Uh, uh, in each launch, there used to be some interface issue, some small incident in the launch pad right. in the during preparation time. In fact, what we faced recently, GSLV is yeah. again bringing back those memories. <laughs> no, but this yeah. is not nothing uh, uncommon. If right. you take any launch vehicle developing agency across the world, mm -hmm. they go through this kind of experiences to reach the perf perfection. And PSLV has been really the most satisfying uh, if you ask me, I feel satisfied that it has become a world-class vehicle. It's incredibly successful track yes. record, and you use it to not only launch satellites for India, but uh, yeah, it has launched. Yeah. In fact, we uh, uh, well, incidentally, when I was mission director, we did the first foreign satellite launch, C2. C1 was the first operational mission where we put IRS-1D, 1200 kg into orbit, and immediately in the next launch, we had already provided slots for carrying, a, because we, you know, all times the the payload mass capability of the vehicle and the spacecraft coming will not match. We have extra capability. So we right. thought, why not we have provision to carry ah, and make use of that capability. That's how we created two slots for carrying, we called it uh, passenger payloads. Right. Of course, in Arian, it was there, that concept. So here we created, and in C2 itself, we carried... Uh, Korean satellite, KITSAT-1 and uh, uh, Technical University of Berlin, uh, TUB right. sat. Uh -huh. And uh, it was successful delivery. And then uh, C3 also we had BIRD and PROBA. Uh -huh. PROBA of ESA and uh -huh. uh, BIRD again from uh, Berlin. You never met him, but Vikram Sarabhai is well known yeah, within yeah, sure. the space program as the father of the space yeah. program. His initial desire was that India should focus the program, space program, on national development. Yeah. And you know, that was 60, 50 years ago yeah, yeah, when sure. you were first thinking mm -hmm. of this. But today we have, uh, as you mentioned, the commercial element, there's a military element, there's a science element, mm -hmm. you know, Moon and Mars. Yeah, yeah. Is it inevitable that the objective, the purpose, would have come in this direction rather than remaining focused on national development? Uh, see, what we have to see is this. We are meeting the requirement of national development, but also if you want to remain active and be an equitable partner in what's happening across the world, mm -hmm. you cannot shut yourself off from the development. The thing is, if you want to keep the younger generation and fresh people coming into the field to be interested, Definitely you must be part of the excitement what's happening all over. 
So, in that context I do not see there is any dichotomy of the purpose. Definitely I appreciate Sarabhai because I, I used to tell uh, very often even when we joined in 72, I joined in 72, not only uh, we were all excited as engineers doing something you know very interesting, challenging. But if you take the general popul population of India, including our own families, uh -huh. they were all thinking why you we people are dabbling in something, you know, of course initially we had a failures also. Uh -huh. So the general perception at the time was we are wasting time, money, India is not <laughs> supposed to be to doing be. these things. Right. You know, so when I look at look back at that, I can't but wonder at the the great vision and uh, conviction of Sarabhai to tell way back in 60 mm -hmm. that we have to get into this field and it has such a great potential. Mm -hmm. And his soft quoted statement that we, not the question of whether we can afford, the question of whether we can afford not okay. to. Mm -hmm. That is something, you know, uh, I, in, and at the time he might have been maybe in his 40s, but mm -hmm. it's really great level of maturity and vision that he foresaw mm -hmm. that we cannot afford to you know, not uh, drop and not enter this. Definitely when you ask in the initial days we were really having our own doubts and whether we can do such a complex job. Mm -hmm. But today I can say the confidence level even at our <laughs> next level of people is quite high because we have been able to handle very complex engineering jobs and prove that we can accomplish success. We are sitting about uh, a couple of kilometers from the site of the very first rocket launch yeah. here in India on the 21st of November. 1963, 50 years almost in a few couple of months. How will you commemorate that event here at Vikram Sarabhai Space Center? Do you have any plans? Yeah, we do have plans of commemoration. As you know, uh, some publications are planned and also a planned function. But then, uh, you know, we all, we are right now seized with the uh, uh, with the very compelling requirement for us to prove the GSL. <laughs> uh, we are all expecting that this launch will be over yesterday right. and we can really <laughs> plunge into the celebration. Right. But unfortunately, okay, the, but so, this is how things are in this field and one has to be prepared for. And I don't know, I think uh, if we are able to make this launch happen immediately in a couple of months, I am sure we will yeah. celebrate it in a very grand way. It's just a, a very busy calendar. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan, uh, Director of Vikram Sarabhai Space Centre, Thank you very much indeed. It's been very enlightening. Okay, thank you.